Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Howard Lauber. I am the uh, CEO of Vector Group and the chairman of the board of Douglas Hellman, a real estate brokerage company. And it's, uh, we're privileged to be a sponsor at this event, uh, which I think you'll all agree is a fantastic event for all of us. Our next panel is going to provide us with a world view on U.S. commercial real estate and capital markets. We'll be getting that perspective from a very distinguished group of real estate investors, global real estate investors and lenders. Let me try to introduce our panel. All the way to my right is Seamus Ferran, Senior Vice President for Global Alternative Asset Management with Brookfield Asset Management headquartered in Canada. with Integra Solutions, equity company based here in Miami. Next, I'm going to skip Steve and come back to him. He's a moderator. Next is Mark Myers, who heads the Wells Fargo Commercial Real Estate Group as an executive vice president, and he's here joining us from San Francisco. And uh, right to the right of me here is Michael Fuchs, who is with RFR principal at RFR Holdings partners with A.B. Rosen, a privately held real estate investment development and management company uh, that is global, and but based in New York City. And last but not least is my good friend and business partner, Steve Whitkoff. Steve is chairman and CEO of the Whitkoff Group, a New York-based real estate investment firm that owns a diverse portfolio of real estate nationwide in all sectors, uh, commercial and uh, residential. Steve is also a great friend and supporter of the School of Business and our, the School of Business's really new real estate program. He chairs the Real Estate Program Advisory Board. And so I'd like to thank Steve very much for uh, moderating this panel. And uh, please come up and let me turn it over to you. Thank, thank you, Howard. Thank you, Howard. Howard is a dear friend of mine. Um, and and uh, hopefully um, you'll get a lot of insight and good thoughts from our panelists today. today. I thank everybody for coming here and everybody um, for supporting um, the University of Miami real estate program. Dean, we actually have a potential person for the board, a good friend of mine who uh, just mentioned it to me today. He's potentially a big donor. Too. He's got a lot of capacity, this guy. And I don't want to say who he is, but I'm looking right at him right now. He's a good friend of me and Howard's. <laughs> and most importantly, most importantly, because I am a Jewish kid from the Bronx, I want to acknowledge my mom who is here today, and I'm hoping that uh, Mark, uh, uh, <laughs> Mark Myers, who runs all of real estate at Wells Fargo, will spend a minute with her and tell her all the big deals that I'm doing with, with, with Wells Fargo, because she's going to be very impressed. So Mark, you've got to give her at least one minute. <laughs> okay. Should we... Um, Maybe before we ask some questions, maybe each one, each of the panelists will, will give um, the audience just a bit of background on what they do. Uh, Michael, my good friend Michael. Yeah, Alpha was formed. Yeah, Alpha Alpha was uh, formed. 1991 by my childhood friend A.B. Rosen and myself. We uh, started to accumulate a real estate portfolio, commercial real estate portfolio in New York City, uh, then build it uh, out to also to residential. Uh, we acquired and built like 3,000 units on the Upper East Side. Since you are active in New York City, you have automatically, as a side product, a retail portfolio. And as a last asset class, we branched out into hotels. We, um, around these assets, we built a full service integrated real estate company. Um, we're doing all sales, leasing, management, asset management for these, for these asset classes. Uh, the notion is that we are having this platform that we can create value for, for our partners. I just wanted to say for us and the partners, not, but for us as first the partner and then us. And uh, um, that's um, 
in, in, in a nutshell in respect of the real estate platform. Our investment philosophy is that we are, are uh, investing in fundamental strong markets like New York City, uh, either in undervalued assets or in uh, we're buying buildings where there's an under rent um, and we are buying, bringing the under rent to the market. A good example is uh, we bought Seagram's building, the Park Avenue and 53rd Street, and Mark is a, a distinguished tenant of ours, um, is and when we bought it uh, in 99, the building rent was $45 a square foot, the market rent was $80. 2013, the building rent is $95, and we are signing lease now $135, $145 a square foot. So um, we are very attracted. We did very well with high iconic assets where we can do a branding. And, and uh, if you do it right, I mean, if you're in the right market, you have a never ending value creation on, on these, these trophy assets. Thanks, Michael. Where, uh, where's your mother again, Steve? She's, she's Mark, she's uh, right there. Oh, OK. And, and, and don't forget to tell her we're paying off that loan in yeah, right. fast order. Right. <laughs> uh, so, so first of all, let me, let me thank you for, uh, uh, for inviting me to the conference. Let me also thank you. Okay, oh, 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 I'm sorry. So let me, let me, first of all, can you hear me? Let me thank you uh, for inviting me to the conference. Um, we had a great lunch hosted by HFF. Thank you, Manny. And let me also thank all of you in the room who are clients of Wells Fargo. We very much appreciate the business, so thank you very much. Um, again, I'm Mark Myers. I'm with Wells Fargo. I'm based in San Francisco. I run our commercial real estate lending business. Uh, it's about an $85 billion on balance sheet business. Uh, we do that through a regional office network uh, throughout the country, and we have two international offices, one in Toronto and one in London. And I hope today to give you some perspective around what I see in the debt capital markets and uh, specifically what's, what's going on in the bank market. So uh, again, thank you for, uh, for including me. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paulo Melo. I'm uh, from Brazil. And I'm the principal of, uh, sorry. I'm the principal of uh, Integra Solutions. Uh, we are a real estate investment firm. Uh, based in Miami, but uh, with obvious uh, Brazilian roots. Uh, we have started investing in the U.S. Uh, uh, in 2001, so, sorry. So, uh, a little bit over 10 years ago, and uh, I guess we kind of evolved as the uh, uh, family uh, investment uh, boutique into a friends and family. And as the market evolved and as we became more comfortable with, with the market, we are now uh, looking into uh, development deals and, uh, and trying to take advantage of this new cycle in a, in a more uh, 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 sophisticated uh, uh, capacity. Right. Thank you. Seamus? Hi. My name is Seamus Foran from Brookfield. Uh, I'm based in Canada, in Toronto. Our real estate operations are within North America are split between Toronto and New York. So in addition to echoing uh, Mark's uh, sentiments, I also thank you for the uh, weather. Um, <laughs> when I landed yesterday, we had an, about a 70 degree difference from when I left when I landed. So that was terrific. Uh, Brookfield is in the global asset management business. Uh, we have about $170 billion of assets under management, all in real assets. And that consists of real estate, infrastructure, which includes rail lines, transmission facilities, ports, and power generation. About $105 billion is represented by real estate. Uh, we invest on a global basis, but only in those areas where we have operating platforms. And that consists of North America, Brazil, UK and Western Europe, and Australia. Uh, about 70% of our equity is invested in the United States. Uh, we're really in the, I would say, the four major food groups. Uh, from an office perspective, we own about 100 million square feet of uh, primarily core office space. 
Uh, in retail, we own about 160 million square feet, primarily through our ownership interest in general growth properties. In multifamily, we own and or manage about 50,000 units in the United States. And most recently, we entered the industrial business uh, through the acquisition of a company called Verde, which was focused on southwestern, uh, southwestern U.S. and Mexico. Uh, within the Opportunity Fund space, which is where I spend my time, uh, over the last 25 years, we have invested about $20 billion of equity uh, in that space. Thank you. Um, we're going to take you back to 2008-2009, the financial crisis. And I'd, I'd like you to tell the audience, each of you please, um, what your thoughts were back then and if the evolution of the real estate marketplace has, um, has evolved in a way that you thought it would uh, over the last four years. Seamus? Uh, no, I, uh, I would say, you know, in 2008, um, we were fully expecting uh, a boatload of opportunities that we couldn't possibly have the capital to, uh, to take full advantage of. Uh, and in a nutshell, over a very short period of time, I would say, you know, that vast expected window closed appreciably. Um, clearly, our initial thought was that most of our investing activity was going to be buying bad loans from banks across the U.S. primarily. And, uh, you know, that just didn't happen. I think the, the profits that the banks were able to generate through a very positive carry trade enabled their balance sheets to be restored to the extent that they did not have to take losses on real estate. Mark, you can probably expand on that far better than I can. Um, but we very quickly had to <coughs> shift our focus away from what we thought was going to be our core business over that period of time and start focusing on broken companies, broken balance sheets, and otherwise undermanaged real estate. And so as a result, you know, we acquired our interest in general growth properties out of bankruptcy. We acquired Fairfield, our multifamily group, out of bankruptcy. We acquired uh, the infrastructure business and most of the multifamily business from Babcock and Brown, an Australian-based uh, retail uh, uh, fund investor. And, uh, and we fo focused a lot on buying real estate from corporate owners, really looking for those opportunities uh, to buy undermanaged real estate as opposed to a lot of debt. Um, I, um, I think we were excited actually because uh, we, uh, since between 2001 and 2006, we, uh, we obviously saw the, 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 the market booming at a, at, a, at a very significant pace and we started uh, uh, just to give you an example, uh, the, the last property that we bought in Miami, Miami-Dade, was in 2004, because we already kind of started smelling uh, that something bad would happen. Uh, so we kind of put a put a, a foot on the brakes uh, on acquisitions, and uh, and somehow waited for uh, for for a correction. And uh, and and you know we didn't obviously didn't know when that was going to happen. But um, but it eventually did, and uh, and in our particular case, uh, we had a, a large liquidity event in Brazil, which freed up quite a bit of capital for uh, reinvestment, and uh, and we uh, we just it, it kind of was kind of the perfect sp storm for us in that sense. So uh, by the time 2008 uh, came, uh, we were uh, you know obviously everybody was very scared because of the magnitude of the crisis. So you didn't know how long it was going to take for the for the market to come back, and and uh, and uh, and you know with all this, you know, uh, ten years of absorption and you know all that uh, uh, that dynamic. Uh, but uh, I guess we 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 have, uh, even though we're we're we are opportunistic, we are uh, uh, you know we always are, but we we also have a a long term approach, and that's and that's kind of culture w when it comes to real estate investments from Brazilians. Uh, we tend to have a longer term approach. And uh, so we, we just saw that as a good window 
and, uh, and, and actually an opportunity to, um, to uh, kind of you know, go back into the market with more, uh, with more force. And, uh, uh, and we did so. I mean, uh, 2008, 2009 was, was relatively difficult to get deals done. Um, but, uh, but after 2010 or so, it, it kind of became a little mm -hmm. easier. And we you know, kind of were a little bit patient. But I guess it paid off. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, so, <coughs> so, apologize. So, so Steve, in 2008, uh, 2009, for me personally, it felt like I was in the eye of the storm. So if you think back to 2008, um, uh, we were involved in the, the largest bank merger uh, at the time and probably the largest bank merger that will happen, Wells Fargo and Wachovia. Uh, the deal actually consummated January 1st, uh, 2009. And in January 1st, 2009, uh, those of us at Legacy Wells Fargo inherited a $40 billion troubled real estate loan portfolio from Wachovia. Um, so not very clear in terms of directionally where the markets were headed. Uh, fortunately, we had the benefit of purchase accounting and were able to mark that portfolio at a, at a, at a, at a price uh, that we felt on a relative basis was pretty attractive. But the goal was you needed to work through and liquidate that portfolio over time. So it took us about three and a half years to, to chew through the portfolio. Um, not unlike some of the other distressed owners of, of real estate at that time, I think we were all helped by really two things. One most important, interest rates. So interest rates uh, were low, and uh, with low rates, thanks to the Fed and thanks to uh, Bernanke, uh, he effectively inflated asset values, and over time, uh, value of the underlying collateral rose. Uh, borrowers, given the low interest rates, were able to hang on longer and longer and help sort of muddle through the process. Uh, that coupled with some decent economic news beginning in 2011, and that coupled with the fact that the banks were able to begin to rebuild their balance sheets again, begin to make money. You know, we sit here today um, in, a, you know, in a pretty interesting place, albeit that the real estate fundamentals, generally speaking, haven't, haven't improved much. Uh, what you have seen is improvement in terms of liquidity in the system. Rates continue to be low. Uh, beginning to see some job growth, uh, and beginning to see, most important, the recovery of the housing market. And uh, so I think 2008, 2009, difficult period, not a lot of good clarity. Fortunately, we were out of it. And, uh, you know, looking forward to sort of the prospects that, that are ahead of us in terms of the business. Michael? You know, I mean, I, <coughs> I agree with Mark. Uh, as I said, we, 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 we started our company in 1991. And uh, that was something like where the first downturn from the 80s finished up and we went up. We had basically, a, for 15, 16 years, only one direction. It was something from 1991 to 2007. You were a genius. It didn't ma matter what you did. And uh, you know, for in the respect of, of real estate people with big egos, plus they were invincible and uh, for us, we uh, had a very, very good run until 2007. 2000 some, 2007 comes, Lehman bankruptcy heightened with the crisis. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody switched off the, the light. It's literally. I mean, if you look at the statistics, in 2007, for NYC, we had, uh, I think, um, like 350 transactions totaling $50 billion on an average per square foot price of $850 a square foot. 2009, we had like 66 transactions uh, totaling $5 billion, uh, with a square foot price of $350 a square foot. That's tr trades only who got foreclosed or had to sell. Um, fortunately, now when we look at you know, New York as, a, as, as one of these beautiful recovery stories, as we are now in 2012, um, we are now, uh, we had like 250 transactions totaling $25 billion and with a $750 a square foot uh, average price. So we are back and I think 2013 will be, uh, will surpass on the volume as well as on the square foot price. So I've, I'm, I'm, I'm feel, uh, 
very bullish for 2013, 2014, for the next three years, um, because a lot of money were, is on the sidelines, and they were tiptoeing uh, the market to see is, is the recovery really there. And after two and a half years and missed opportunities, this money is ready to get into the, into the, into the market. In respect of something like the scary moments, I mean, from 2007 we, till 2010, we had to play uh, defense. Um, we were like probably more of the people where you <laughs> would, would have looked at, at our loans or, 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 or in, in that respect. Because we had some, uh, it was not uh, all the assets were performing, but there were certain loan maturities. So what you have to do, it's, it's normally you, the in interesting thing in, the, in the 2007 to 2010 was that you had, everything took a long time, six to nine months for a loan extension. Um, you were blocked in order to even think about new things. So we, we were restructuring, restructuring re, uh, recasting, extending loans. And again, you know, Bernanke is, we have pictures of Bernanke everywhere. He's our the, the biggest hero. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, he saved a lot of, uh, uh, you know, real estate and then that this wave didn't become worse. Um, that's, uh, yeah. Thank I'm you, Michael. Point. Um, we, we, we were discussing at lunch, and, and uh, Mark, I'd like you to take, take a stab at this first. We were discussing at lunch um, all of our views that the debt markets have become significantly more efficient. CMBS is back again. Banks want to lend. They're looking to expand the net interest margins. How does that affect um, what Wells Fargo is going to be doing out there? not necessarily in New York, but more generically, and do you see Wells Fargo expanding its lending platform in uh, southern Florida? And, and each of you, please um, um, uh, answer the question with, re with regard to your own specific businesses, how you see the more efficient debt markets helping your business. Well, you, you're right, Stephen. Clearly, the, the, the debt markets have been rebuilt, and rebuilt very quickly. So CBS, uh, I think the CBS market did $40 billion of, of originations last year. Uh, I think they expect that market to grow upwards of 50%. You're beginning to see uh, the CMBS market compete head on head with the life company market in terms of success. And in terms of the kinds of assets that they'll finance. Uh, you know, the bank market, if you think about the bank market today, uh, there's about $10 trillion of deposit money sitting in the banks today. Ten trillion dollars. I'm sorry. Can I just ask everyone to move their microphones up a little bit because they, they're having difficulty hearing this back? Is this better? Helpful? Yeah. So, so if you think about the liquidity in the bank market, it's about a ten trillion dollar. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a rock concert. Uh, so, uh, ten trillion dollars of deposit money in the banks. The banks today are unfortunately lending about 84% of their total deposits. So call it 15% of the deposit money uh, is going un unlent or unborrowed. So 15% on $10 trillion is, uh, is $1.5 trillion of money that could be lent in the system but can't find a home. So there's tremendous, tremendous liquidity in the system. Um, we're in an enviable position. We also at Wells Fargo have unmet uh, deposit capital, want to put it to work. Uh, we have a pretty robust team. In fact, some of my colleagues are here uh, who are based here in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, Orlando, and Jacksonville. So we've got a big commitment to this state. Um, those of you that aren't clients of ours, I'm sure my colleagues would be more than happy to convert you today. Uh, but it's an important place for us. Uh, it's a very important state uh, for us, um, and uh, you know we'll be here. Uh, we'll be here a long time, um, and, and, and hope to certainly grow the book. Um, Paulo, um, um, as far as financing goes, uh, we are uh, we obviously feel the need to take advantage of it because uh, just because we're historically at uh, uh, low levels of of, uh, of, of interest rates and uh, 
we uh, we are relatively new to the financing game uh, here in the U.S. Uh, we're actually we're going to close on our first loan I think next week. Uh, everything else that we've done was uh, was was cash purchases. So so but but we are we are uh, again uh, uh, because of the cultural uh, uh, baggage that we have we're relatively conservative in terms of uh, how we leverage ourselves, especially in real estate. And uh, I think uh, we would have a very hard time uh, um, approving a, pro a project internally or even taking a harder look at a project uh, if, it, if it underwrites, if it has to underwrite at an above 65% uh, uh, leverage ratio. So we are, we are you know, we are very conservative on, on that front. Seamus? So within Brookfield globally, first I'll speak about real estate. Um, but in every asset class, we are a very large consumer of long-term debt capital being, you know, focused on real asset uh, categories. So in 2012, uh, we completed the refinancing of about $12 billion of debt across the board on a long-term basis. Um, as an example, GGP, which prior to uh, the recession was the single largest borrower in the CMBS space in the United States, um, last year completed about $4 billion of refinancings on a very accretive basis, uh, given where interest rates had reduced to. Um, within our world in the opportunistic fund space, um, we, we are dealing with transitional assets and as a result we tend to focus on much shorter term highly flexible floating rate debt that you know isn't really provided by 80 percent of the market CMBS providers are not there yet uh, they haven't come back to the floating rate world yet so it's a much narrower band of, of lenders that we can deal with in the United States for, for that type of product um, so I, I, I wouldn't say that um, we were certainly not benefiting it to the same extent as our core office company is, as an example. Hopefully, however, our competitors are, are similarly positioned. And if anything, we always like to suggest that we get the, we get the benefit of, of preference from the major financial institutions because of their need to lend to good sponsors, especially on transitional assets. The other comment I would make going to what Mark had suggested about uninvested capital primarily in the United States and Canada to a, to a degree as well is that we're really trying to bring capital uh, across the globe where we otherwise have operations because there's a, there's a very significant arbitrage between borrowing money in the United States, for example, and what it costs to borrow money in Australia or what it costs to borrow money in South America. You know, both areas that we have very significant real estate and infrastructure operations. You know, if we can bring three lenders like a Wells Fargo down to those markets, you know, we, we would be saving hundreds of millions of dollars over time just from, you know, creating a much more uh, competitive and efficient marketplace. So that's, that's a big effort on our part. And, and Michael, you, um, you and AB run an opportunistic business. Um, are the more efficient debt markets, in your view, going to help your business or level the playing field and create more competition? No, I, I think it's, um, it definitely helps. It's, uh, uh, let, let me say, like, like we, are, we are doing what we have done over the last 20 years. We, uh, we're buying quality assets in, in strong fundamental markets. And back to my example when I said, you know, somebody turned off the switch in 2007. It's that liquidity. The value was always there. Just the liquidity in order to unleash the value was not there. That's why you have these big gaps in, in respect of uh, um, a bid and ask. You know, the opportunistic funds, they want to buy it for 10 cents on the dollar, 20 cents, the stress, the stress, the stress. They, 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 uh, the uh, uh, real estate owner says this is worth 80% and not, no trade comes, comes together. So we are now something like seeing in 2011, the liquidity gap was, was, was funded by equity and we are really 
excited and happy that now something like the CMBS market and balance sheet lenders are coming back to the market and that there's competition. Before, you needed to tell a, you know, any assets. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of herd mentality in the, in the banking, banking field. And when, when there's the best thing in order to get transactions done is when you have competition. And it, you, you could have gone to, with our best asset, with asking for 30 cents. If nobody else is in the market, nobody does anything. And uh, in, we have now, uh, over the last year, I see the biggest changes in, in the finance market. Um, what is interesting, um, and, and maybe Mark can help me on this, a couple of months ago, S&P changed uh, the rating, how they look, and how, you, how the banks on the CNBS underwrites high-end assets. And that helped now what, to help our philosophy that we can now buy again these, these uh, very superior assets without, uh, with a decent debt stack in place. Um, and another change what we have uh, noticed uh, in the last three months, lenders are listening again to a story. They're not like, you know, we were in 2011, 2012, 12% debt yield, 15% debt yield. It was just a question of debt yield. Um, today, you can say, hey, we have a property. It's, it's in this location. This is our business plan. We are repositioning it. Um, we're putting 30, 40% of equity in there. They listen, and they are also going ahead. We, are, we had uh, one acquisition where we are buying now a vacant, we bought a vacant building on uh, 285 Madison Avenue, on 41st Street and Madison Avenue. The, we were surprised how many offers we got on a vacant office building. It was an acquisition financing with a repositioning on no cash flow at all. And we had like 10 offers from, from very uh, different sources of financing. Thank you. Let's talk about, um, about Miami. Um, it's a vibrant uh, marketplace. Um, hopefully, all four of you are going to be cheerleaders um, with regard to it. I actually want to know your own view. But I want you to be a cheerleader because we have the head of real estate from Google here. And if you're a cheerleader, maybe he'll go back and convince his board to make a substantial investment in the, in the Miami marketplace. So um, Seamus, uh, no negative here. No, I'm only kidding, only kidding, only kidding. We want to, we want to, we want to, we want to, your, your real view. So, um, well, I'll, I'll break it down into uh, the four food groups, first off. Um, we are here uh, on a retail basis through John Brook. They own four malls in, in South Florida. Um, oh, they, they can't hear you. Retail space, we are here uh, in the form of our investment in general growth, and and they have an they they have ownership of four malls in South Florida. So uh, clearly, we're invested in, in the market in that respect. Secondly, um, on the multifamily space, we've over the last year acquired two assets in South Florida, uh, one for our value add fund, one for our core fund, and and they're <coughs> continuing to look for other opportunities. Um, for multifamily investment. On the office side, it, it's a lot harder. And, and it's, it's not a function of what we think about the market and the market's um, expectations for growth and, and demand generation. The, the issue for us within Brookfield is that uh, we, need, we need scale in a transaction. And there are not a lot of transactions of a scale that um, that we can justify playing in. Um, any asset that has sold in the South Florida market, uh, whether it was Miami Tower or Everglades, uh, Flagler, we, we tried to buy Flagler twice. <laughs> the first time when it was Florida East Coast Railroad and we were trying to buy the rail operations for our infrastructure fund and, and we wanted the real estate. Um, and, and Fortress ended up buying that. And then most recently, 18 months ago or so, when Fortress was looking to sell the real estate component, and, and we bid hard on, on that opportunity. So, so we liked that opportunity because it gave us the scale that we need to, to participate. Um, 
the, the, the second thing I would say is that we, we, we try and be as efficient with our capital as possible. And as a result, we, we just don't find that uh, bidding with 15 other groups on a single asset gives us the most efficient use of our capital. We, we would far prefer to look for more complex situations, uh, disparate portfolios across many geographies that have the impact of whether it's because of size or whether it's because of a combination of product type or product quality of weeding out 80% of the, of, the, of the buyer pool. And, and that's where we think we get the most efficient use of our capital. And unfortunately, there just haven't been that many opportunities over the last five years that have included assets in South Florida. You know, if, if there are, like Flagler, I mean, that was clearly uh, an example. Um, and in, in that case, uh, they, they just decided to sell the industrial uh, separately and, and continue to hold the office. And we were hoping that they wanted to sell the whole portfolio and that we could buy the whole thing. So it's, it, for us, it's situational. It's not, it's not, it's not a comment on the market. Uh, we, we tend to underwrite markets as the situations arise and as the opportunities are put in front of us. Thank you. Uh, Paolo? Um, um, I, think, I think Miami is, uh, is very uniquely positioned. Um, and uh, I'm, it's a very young city. For, for as far as I'm concerned, Miami is 35 years old. As far as as, as real uh, as taking the next, uh, you know, taking sustainable steps towards being a a, 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 a 24 hour city and uh, and being a, a, a center for for Latin America and and, and, and attracting uh, uh, Europe capital and in, and even U.S. Uh, 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 interest as well because uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, early 80s, uh, Miami was had kind of a bad rep. So, so I think I think, and it takes time for for you to to really turn a city into uh, into a, a, a mature uh, a metropolitan area. It's, I think it's still maturing. There's a, a there's a you can you can say. And, and look at, at, at all of the South American interests uh, into Miami as a, as, a, as a dependency that Miami has on, on that capital. But I, I kind of look at it differently. I, I think it's, it's, it's good that Miami has that, and it kind of acts as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a foundation, and it's something that you can, you can it helps, it's gonna help you grow uh, uh, over time. And, uh, and, uh, and so, the just geographically speaking, the the the, the interaction that it has with Latin America, uh, what has happened in Latin America during during the past ten years or so, uh, has a lot to do with Miami as well, and, and, and how sustainable this relationship is going to be. Uh, I think, uh, and I can I can speak for uh, uh, about Brazil. I, I know that. Uh, we don't see as pragmatic and as uh, uh, realist, realistic as we are about the future of Brazil. We uh, we don't think it's gonna it, it will ever take a step back uh, to you know uh, uh, as economically speaking. I think I think uh, and and that step forward that pretty much all of Latin America took uh, will help. Uh, has helped Miami and will continue to do so in the future. Now, uh, I think what we need is 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 to take the next step, right? Is, is to how do we, you know, how do we attract? And we spoke about this over lunch. How do we attract, uh, you know, long-term talent? Uh, how do we attract industries? How do we attract uh, uh, and 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 make this a, a magnet for 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 human capital? That's what that's what I think the next step is going to, to be for Miami. Right. Thank you. Can I ask him how many billions can we expect from South America to come fl flowing in into uh, in South Beach or in Miami? Uh, difficult to say. There's a lot that has been spent already. Uh, I, I don't. I, I could There's something we we are um, the developers of the W Hotel here on, on South Beach. And uh, just as a, as a as a story, I, I looked at my handy at one time. And, uh, 
we uh, uh, I, I got an email from from the wall. It's 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 a it's a nightclub uh, connected to W, and it said we hit our highest grossing number uh, tonight. It was eighty five thousand dollars. And somebody took the whole place. It's like it just a three four thousand square foot um, venue. He says no, it was one table. And then <laughs> then I thought, <laughs> and then I thought. Okay, it must have been maybe some oligarch who's like some Russian with a lot of entourage, uh, had a beautiful night. He said, no, it was a Brazilian. It was a me. Two, two Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> two Brazilian. And it was something like uh, the best of the best ordered everything with, with a lot of table decoration around it with, with the streamers. However, uh, it was, I was very, very you know, surprised. So there is, can you, can you somehow put, there's a, a enormous liquidity, you know, free liquidity, and uh, open liquidity, what comes here to, 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 uh, to Miami and Miami Beach on the, on the le leisure side. Um, why, uh, so how you think how much more can we expect? And, and well, what are you going to do to bring the billions here? I, I, I'll he, wants, I'll he wants to know if that same guy would spend 125000 yeah. <laughs> on a particular evening. I'll, and I'll Jay, Jay from Google is finding this interesting too, by the way. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you this. I mean, there's, there's a few signs that, that show uh, how long-term this is. I mean, uh, uh, American Airlines, uh, and, and again, I'm talking about Brazil because that's what I know. I don't know anything you know, about Colombia or Venezuela. but. Uh, American Airlines flies uh, direct to, I think, seven capitals of Brazil. Uh, they have, I think, three daily flights uh, from Sao Paulo, I think two to Rio, I'm not sure. And then, you know, uh, uh, daily flights to, I think, five or six other uh, uh, capitals. And uh, they're adding two more at the end of this year. So that in itself, that shows, I mean, the, the, the access of Brazilians to Miami is much easier. I take a direct flight to my hometown, Brazil, so it's 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 just much easier. And uh, and and the, the second thing, I mean, it, you know, it kind of goes para passu. Uh, the wealth that has been created in Brazil is unbelievable, unbelievable. Now we're talking. <laughs> so, so that's you know that's uh, and 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 because of the relationship that Brazil has with, with Miami. I mean, Brazilians love Miami because of, you know, because of the, uh, the wall and, and uh, you know, the shopping and, and, and so forth. Um, we are very comfortable with, with Miami. And, uh, and everybody wants to have a place here. And, uh, you know, and it might not be the, I'm not sure if, you know, it's, I'm not sure if it's a, an investment really or if it's, you know, I might as well buy it because you know I go to uh, 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 my country club and all my friends have it and, and I don't and my wife is you know uh, yapping because I don't have one so <laughs> now I, I, I gotta have one it, and it's it, it, it's it's that simple it's that simple sometimes so I mean bottom line is there's there's a lot of uh, identification and 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 a lot of of, of interaction between uh, Brazil and and and, and Florida. So I don't think that's going away. I don't think it is. I don't think you're going to see it as, you know, as heavily as we saw during the past three years. But I don't think it'll go away. And, and, and Mark, we were talking about this at lunch. Um, George Perez was saying that um, he even underestimated the Latin phenomenon and how much traction it has in this marketplace today. Um, how does Wells Fargo? Can Wells Fargo's credit committee underwrite around that, uh, around that, that buying surge, yeah, and yeah. what's happening in this marketplace? And do you think that you'll expand your office here, um, send Dave Martin, Mike P yeah. Kaczynski, and Vanessa down here to, um, uh, to, to supplement the uh, South Florida staff? Yeah, if you'd let them go, see, <laughs> we'd, we'd be happy to move. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, if you go back to the eye of the storm, if you go back to 08 and 09. By any measurement 
of historical proportion. The amount of condo supply existed here in South Miami was arguably upwards of 10 to 12 years. So 10 to 12 years of supply of product that existed at the eye of the storm. You know, an imponderable number. Um, you know, what was interesting is how quickly that got absorbed um, and how quickly prices recovered. Um, and what's very interesting that we learned at lunch today is the amount of new projects that are being built today, condo towers, effectively without tank financing. So how's that being done? It's being done with buyer deposit money that's upwards of 80% of the purchase price. Uh, so a, sort of a fascinating phenomenon. But, but I will go back just to Miami just for a minute because uh, I think it's a really good question about what's, where does Miami fit uh, you know, on the U.S. stage in terms of being a, you know, a great city. And when you think about great cities, I think they have the combination of the following. Great intellectual capital, great infrastructure, a great health care, great education. And the cities that are really thriving today have technology. So to, you know, to, the, to Jay at Google. Um, and that feels like the missing, slight missing piece of the puzzle here. It, it has every other component, intellectual capital, Great infrastructure, um, you know, good education system, um, but the technology piece seems to be missing when you pit it against the Boston's, the New York's, the San Francisco's, the LA's. Um, so, um, but Jay's here to solve that, you know, that 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 problem for us. Uh, Bernanke has said, by the way, that he's going to keep rates low until 2015 unless the unemployment rate gets to 6.5%. Uh, how is he keeping rates low? He's, he's buying $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities monthly. Um, when you think about how long it's going to take to get unemployment to 6.5%, the, the issue really isn't it's the participation rate. And the participation rate in this country, I, I think, is, is close to an all-time low. So there are folks. Um, who are choosing not to participate in the job market, keeping sort of an artificial, uh, well, I don't know if it's a ceiling or a, a floor on, on, on unemployment. So the, un the argument is the unemployment rate is actually higher than we all, than, than what's published. But, uh, but that is a, you know, I think that is a question for those of us, but it's bottom, um, our real estate fundamentals are really all about jobs really all about jobs and and so you tell me you know where jobs are growing and and I'll tell you that's probably a very interesting place to invest real estate capital I mean, at, uh, Bailey, that's I, I think that's that's the problem what, what, what we see uh, nationwide we have like nationwide 15% uh, occupant uh, vacancy rate in the, in, uh, in the office space uh, through different reconfigurations I would call it like Googleization, meaning you you create beautiful common areas, but the, the workers and the employees work in little cubicles. You have you know the eye, you know the, the pots uh, where people meet. You have the, the coffee espresso bar. You have the lifestyle. You have the ping ping pong table in the middle of of, of the lobby. But the employees they work uh, in these little cubicles. So that's something like, and we see that in in all the industries. I mean, uh, if it's accounting. Uh, uh, um, legal technology. Um, so, if you add that to the fifteen percent, you are now at twenty-five and thirty percent. So, twenty-five, thirty percent—that's that's a big number. Uh, I don't see that's f that's where I'm also scared in respect of of of, of the office market. And uh, at RFR, we made the decision that we are staying with with you know with strong fundamental uh, office markets where people want to be or need to be. And uh, that's you know one thing with New York City. In respect of Miami, Miami is good for for uh, for a surprise. Uh, we started with with just investing on the beach, uh, and our philosophy was only uh, our business plan was sand, sex, and sun. That was uh, and uh, and we were like surprised, you know, when we built the the W. Then all of a sudden we have now culture. We have uh, um, uh, musical venues. Um, when you come back from New York, you see new restaurants, but now you, s you all of a sudden find new neighborhoods, right? I mean, uh, Greg Robbins, uh, the speaker before, 
the panelist, he created a, a phenomenal uh, area, which is something like more to what you experience in, in Manhattan, uh, that you create this, this uh, design district. Now you have Wynwood, um, Midtown, Midtown, it's, it's fantastic. And, and George is doing his part by building thousands of, of very affordable, beautiful apartments. I, I, I can't, if I would be Google, I would bring everybody here. Because it's something like, uh, you have a cheap, <laughs> cheap <laughs> source. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a beautiful living and everything is coming growing afterwards you know something like because you now have all these these thousands of apartments what what haven't been filled but they all, all of a sudden need retail and you see all these these different uh stress on on the restaurants on in in miami f packed full and there's a big demand so one one will lead to the other and when you are now coming to miami uh we will do our part too government is about to put a trillion dollars into health care. A billion of it will be in Florida over the next five years. Uh, that'll be the expansion. Health care is one place. While there's been a dip recently, because most of us restructured and took an administrative layer out, it's, um, Florida will become a destination. Ten percent of all the cancer in the United States is here in Florida. That gives you some sense. Those are high margin lines of service for us. Pardon? Cancer care. Or cancer care. Uh, well, patients. Yeah, <laughs> both. Both. But um, uh, that gives you some, we have only 6% of the population. But that's the high margin. That's, yeah, they move here from New York, basically. <laughs> but that gives you, the high margins in healthcare are in cancer. So if you look at that job structure, and what we were lacking here it's not just the intellectual capital, it's the anchor institutions. And that's what George and others have put together, these anchor institutions. We can see it in our enrollments. Our international enrollments are all going up of not kids that are coming on scholarships, but full pays from China and Latin America uh, in particular. So we saw that trend starting actually um, in the early uh, 2000s, so you can see. But the kids that are coming, their parents have figured out a way to get permanent residencies. The Russians, um, the Latin Americans, um, and the Chinese are not simply coming to get an education, but they're figuring out a way to live at least part of the year here with permanent residency. So if you look at those patterns, um, it's very different. And it's a lot of it's Miami.